Okay, everyone, welcome to the Passive Income and Chill podcast. My name is Nana Alice Nayarko, and I'm so excited to have Mr. Mark Russell from Better Wallet on the podcast today. So, Mark, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are and your story. Hey, and thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to, to talk to your audience just about you know how to make money passively. So Better Wallet is all about helping people streamline their money so they can invest more for not only themselves, but also for their family to build true generational wealth. I've been in the game for a couple of years in, in these Instagram streets, but my background is I'm, I'm a licensed financial advisor, or at least I used to be a licensed financial advisor for years for companies like Vanguard. And I work for the alternative investment arm of Blackstone as well, both Wall Street firms. And I worked in fintech. And over time, I was able to work on my passion of teaching people personal finance. And next thing you know, you know, you get one follower, you get 10, you get 100,000. And next thing you know, you have a business on your hands. And, you know, the, the cool thing about it is like, I get to work on my passion every single day, helping people invest their money. And the other cool thing about it is like, they then go off and teach their family how to go about doing it, which is Really nothing but a dream. Another reason why I started Bear Wall is because I found myself like helping multi-millionaires become multi-multi-millionaires. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those multi-millionaires did not look like us. And I told myself that I wanted to, you know, 40 years from now, if I look back, like, what is my impact? Did I just widen the, the wealth gap or did I help to close it? And once I found Instagram and found that, you know, it's a way to like reach more and more people that look like us, that's the way that, you know, Barrel Wallet really took off. And that's been my focus since, since day one, really. Nice. So that's, I mean, that's awesome. But tell us how, how did you actually get into the financial space? Like what, you know, what took you in that direction? I was broke. Let's start with that, right? It always starts yeah. off with like, I didn't have any money whatsoever. So, so I was, I went through adoption care. I went through foster care. I was adopted at 13. And at mm -hmm. 13, I was adopted into a rather low income family. Like we made maybe like $55,000 at the, the height of my, both my parents' careers. Wow. And, you know, you, Growing up, you didn't really know how much money you had or what you didn't. Like, it's just life. And it, you compare yourself to people around you. And back then, you didn't have, like, social media or anything like that. So I'm I'm dating myself. So when I started thinking about going to college, I did well academically in high school. My parents wanted me to both, both of them wanted me to go off to college because they weren't able to. There was a, I, I had to think about how I was going to pay for it. And I was like, well, I'm just going to go to campus. And if I get into a school, I'll figure it out. I'll beg for money, whatever it takes. So Penn State was right in my backyard. It was about an hour away from my hometown. And I found myself on campus and the student aid office was like, hey, like I need $20,000 this year and $20,000 next year. And how are you going to pay for it? And my crazy butt was like, oh, well, I, you know, maybe I'll get some scholarships, grants, loans, whatever. And they're like, it, it doesn't work that way. Maybe loans, but we're in the middle of a recession in 2008, yeah. 2009. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to learn how to manage my money. I had to learn how to apply to grants and scholarships and loans and know what all that stuff means. I had to understand what interest rates meant. And I also had to learn how to, you know, work, which I, I knew from growing up, but, you know, really work on a university, let it be being an umpire. I was a, I was an RA, a resident assistant for multiple years. So you deal with a lot of money management, but the cool thing about it is like, I was also to build like a lot of leadership skills and money management and leadership skills is what a lot of these Wall Street firms, that's what they wanted. So mm -hmm. I also had a degree in, in business economics, which I really only wanted to because I knew I liked money and I knew I liked business. So why not business economics and yeah. not the full way into finance? I was like, I would never be in finance. That's not for me. And after, well, during college, I applied to a lot of different companies and just so happened to get into the Vanguard group, which is the largest mutual fund company in the world. At the time, they didn't, they weren't, they didn't have the accolade. They didn't have the accolade at all. They had maybe like a trillion dollars, which in the asset management world is like not that much money. They, I checked the other day, they have 7 trillion, but I was wow. able to see them go from one to two to three to four. And I learned a lot during that time. So that's basically how I got in. I took the skills that I 
had I, I took the skills that I built through su- survival in order to get into personal finance. Yeah. Uh, so that it was a it was a crazy journey, but I owe a lot to the experience of not being able to pay for school. Yeah, and that had to be quite an experience to be working on Wall Street. It sounds like just coming out of or still during the Great Recession. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was on the more of the up the upswing. So like 2012 is when I graduated from school. And yeah, I think people are just recouping from what happened, but luckily the markets were doing really well from 2012 into 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, So I got to see the, that appreciation and a lot of the asset managers were able to take advantage of that as well. So a lot of growing pains at Vanguard, which I mean, granted, it's a problem that you want to have, like we're taking in too much money and like, we don't know how to like make sure that things aren't breaking from technology to operations. Mm -hmm. So to be able to be a part of that and see that made me really want to do it on my own one day. Yeah. It sounds like a really good training ground. So being in the finance space now, what, I mean, you, you mentioned that you are really helping, I guess, people um, shape their own financial plans and their own financial destiny. So Mm -hmm. how can someone who's interested in, I guess, learning more about finance and how to actually make more money, use their money wisely and grow it? What are some active as well as passive ways to get started doing that. So I always talk about on the show that, you know, you have to get active to get passive, right? You Mm. actually have to do some active work, right? You can't just like, "Mm," and then it's going to show up like, um, well, maybe you can, but for most people, you have to do (laughs) active work, right? Whether that's setting things up. So explain to us how, how someone could go about doing that. Yeah, definitely. And and I mention it all the time enough where my students get sick of me when I bring it up, but like you have to manifest and then do the work. I'm all about dreaming. I'm all about, you know, believing that you can do something, but if you don't put in the work, then you're not going to achieve the results that you want to achieve. And you're, you're totally right. Like you want to get active to get passive. And in terms of investing, you have to learn how to invest the right way through YouTube University, Google University. There's so many different finance creators online that are talking this language and find someone that you relate with, let it be me or Nana, whoever it might be, and find, you know, either pay for guidance, pay for mentorship, or use a lot of their, you know, free products like this podcast here to to learn how to go about managing your money or investing. But once you learn, then the goal is to jump in. Jump in with, even if it's only $100 or $200, jump into the market, figure out what you like, what you don't like, how you react to risk, how you don't react to risk, and control what you can control. Like, notice I didn't say anything about, like, day trading or, like, trying to time the market, whatever, which has been proven to, like, be a losing strategy. And it's also active. It's also active. (laughs) That was going to be my question. Like, are you a fan of individual stock picking, gifts, mutual funds, all the, you know, because I know for a lot of people, especially, and and I'll I'll use myself as as an example. I mean, for years, I just like, okay, my 401k is doing whatever it's doing. I don't really know what it's doing. I was, I had blinders on and I didn't Mm -hmm. quite under, fully understand all the different ways of investing. I would randomly pick some stocks, put a little bit in there, forget mm-hmm. about them. So I, I feel like I have a much different plan now, but for people who are really overwhelmed by all the different strategies, like what is the one that you would recommend? I, I know it's individual, but. Yeah, yeah. So one thing you want to keep in mind is that boring investing is the way to go. Like if you're excited about like investing, you're doing it the wrong way. Sorry. At the end of the day, like investing, you want to put your money in, you want it to grow and you want it to grow passively Mm -hmm. in terms of what I normally suggest. I I suggest like what has worked historically from 1929 until now. And that is buying the index and, and chilling. I I know you will, you'll appreciate this. I always say index and chill. I know it's passive income and chill as being the podcast, but index and chill. And that's the way to go. And I feel like people find out about that later down the road, like after they made their mistakes and they said, wow, that did not work. 
Um, mm. Even though everyone on the internet is telling me that it will work because they were able to get like X amount of gains, but that's another yeah. conversation, um, another podcast episode. Yeah. But basically you want to put money into an index through ETFs or mutual funds and allow it to ride out over the long term. Mm-hmm. The ET, the if if you're like, hey, like I don't know what that is. You're speaking, you know, Chinese. I don't know, like, so imagine a basket of different stocks. In fact, five hundred, close to five hundred and seven of them. If you're, you know, going into like S and P five hundred index fund, mm-hmm. so you have the big company companies that you hear all the time. You have the you know Teslas and the Apples and the Amazons. You have all of that within the basket of five hundred and seven different stocks. And what they call, they call that owning the market because there's a bunch of different stocks from a bunch of different sectors. You have small cap, you know, smaller companies, mid cap, mid-sized companies, and large cap like the Apples and the Amazons of the world. Mm-hmm. So you get to buy into an ETF or mutual fund. You can literally do it in a few different clicks. That is wildly different from trying to buy 507 to be completely diversifying your portfolio. You would be yeah. here for a long time trying to do that. And it's really challenging to go about managing all those. So the cool thing with like an ETF or a mutual fund is that it tracks the index. Like you guys probably heard of like the standard and poor 500. Yeah. So for people who might not totally be familiar, what is the S&P 500? Sure. So the S&P 500 is an index, the most popular index out there, which basically tracks the, the, how the market is growing. So if you just in very basic terms, if you take all the companies, larger companies in the United States, and you said, okay, well, your price per share, the price per stock is X, we're going to aggregate all that together. That's Mm -hmm. basically what the index is. Mm -hmm. And an index fund is nothing but a, a fund manager that comes in and says, okay, well, I'm going to do exactly what the index is doing. If the, if the index is buying Peloton as a company and they're buying Tesla and they're buying Walmart, whatever it might be, we're going to do the same thing and we're going to ride the market because we know, we know one thing in the United States, the United States is all about capitalism. Mm -hmm. We know that the people that are at the top, the CEOs, the, you know, managing directors, the board of directors, they care about one thing and that's increasing earnings per share. And because of that capitalism within the United States, the index tends to go up on average about 10% every single year over the long term. So an right. index fund is nothing. Right. Historically, it, the index has gone up. Right. It goes up. Right. So you know you can go back to 1929, you know, when the S&P first came out and historically has gone up. Sure, you have dips along the way. That just happens. Like, that's like... The same way that you know the the earth goes in market cycles right Mm -hmm. but in on average you know you know the the market goes up so that's basically what an index fund is now to what i want to mention is that you want to start with index funds let's say you have 20 years to invest you know you're investing for retirement you're 40 you want to retire when you're 60. Likely, you are going to have mostly stocks in your portfolio in the form of index funds Mm-hmm. Now, you should also keep in mind that you can add in individual stocks as well. They call it core and, and satellite, satellite, right? So you have like, imagine the earth and then you have the moon kind of like satelliting around it. It's like a okay. typical strategy that advisors use where the core of it is your ETFs, your mutual funds that track the market that you know is going to go up, you know, 10 to 12% annually every year, not, 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 including, not including inflation. But you add in more risky securities that you know and love. Let it be, I keep using Apple and Amazon as like examples, but these are the ones that people know most of. Yeah. You can add those in. What happens is people do the inverse. They'll buy a bunch of individual stocks and then maybe like learn about ETFs and mutual funds later. Mm-hmm. But then they realize that those individual stocks aren't performing well because what performed 10 years ago isn't the same thing that performs now. Right. Like back in the day, if you would have told someone that Kmart wasn't going to be like a, a top company, they would, they, oh, no way. There, there's no way. K, I have a Kmart down the street. You tell They're me everywhere back in the day. over the last five years. 
Yeah. There are none. <laughs> like there's a few, sure. Like you pass by them, you're like, oh my God, like it's a national landmark. Same thing with Sears. Right, well, right. Well, Sears Kmart, yeah. <laughs> So like you allow the fund managers to do their job and sure you can pick those individual stocks, but make that a smaller portion of your total portfolio. You know what it reminds me of? I feel like I'm going on a tangent here, but it reminds me of like Thanksgiving dinner, like Thanksgiving okay. dinner, you know, you have like the, you have the turkey, you have all the healthy food, healthier food. I should mention, unless your turkey's fried, that's another conversation, but you have like all the healthy food and vegetables and but then you also have the pastries, you have the you know sweet potato pie, you have the biscuits, you have all this other stuff. When you're investing, you want to invest into the healthy stuff and then like go in and have your dessert after, but don't yeah. eat like five sweet potato pies. What happens yeah. is the inverse, especially like during COVID when people are starting to invest and they hear the names of like Tesla or like Tesla and, and Peloton and all these other mm -hmm. companies. And that basically leads to a pretty unhealthy diet because you're eating nothing but pastries. Yeah. That's like the analogy that I would think of. So what advice would you give for people? Cause I'm sure a lot of people in our audience did start investing during COVID, right? It was, mm -hmm. it was like, everyone was at home. Everyone was in, in, investing in individual stocks. I actually was fortunate and I had been through it before. So I was like, I'll invest in a couple of individual stocks, but I'm going to do these ETFs and I'm going to mm -hmm. dollar cost average. I'm just going to, I'm like a boring investor. It's so funny because my fiance is like the complete opposite, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm going to do this slow and steady thing. But so for people who started during COVID and they saw these huge gains and these huge returns and they have never experienced a down market before and they're like pooping their pants right now. What mm -hmm. advice would you give to those people? Yeah. I mean, long-term investing is the way to go. I mean, we, in, in the market, you wanted to find your investing returns based off of the last couple decades, not necessarily the last few days or hours or weeks or months or even years at times. You want to look 10, 20 years down the road and you want to invest based off your, your goals. Now, if you're in the individual stocks and you're like, man, like I'm looking at these things and they're not, they're down 30, 50%. You know, some people, some of them lost a lot of their value, you know, 80, 90%. The only thing you can do is what you can control. And what you can control is making sure that you're going into something that's more diversified, being ETFs and mutual funds over, you know, diversified over the, over the long term, right? So you don't you can basically stop putting as much money into those stocks that might not be performing that well and put it into something that's way more stable for your portfolio. Maybe later down the road, you'll see which ones perform, which ones they don't. And at a certain point, this is not advice, but just guidance. Like you, you might have to cut your losses and say, well, you know, the, I'm trying to think of one like Peloton. Peloton's not coming back. Like for example, mm -hmm. and I, I bought into it because everyone, bought a Peloton during COVID and I thought that was going to help my long-term portfolio. You might have to cut your losses and say, well, you know, I lost $3,000 with that. I need to cut my losses so I can put it into, put the money into something that is actually going to gain some money over the long term. But yeah, I mean, like every, a lot of people fell victim to it. Even I like was like, oh, like, you know, oh man, like someone's going into this investment. They just gained 300%. Like, why don't I do that as well? And I had to keep reminding myself that I went through this before. Like I, yeah. it happened Yeah, it, in history, it has happened multiple times, like 2008, the tech bubble mm -hmm. of 2001, where yeah. there were so many people that jumped into these companies, these individual companies and said, I'm going to outperform the market over the long run because I think I'm smarter than these fund managers. And what you realize is that these fund managers have endless amount of money and endless amount of knowledge, and they have endless amount of experience as well. And they've been through it. And they, sometimes they laugh at people when they go and they try to pick individual stocks instead of just doing whatever, you know, works that's boring over the right. long run. Yeah. Okay. So how, what's the, what's the minimum? If someone's like, all right, I'm, I'm down with the slow and steady boring investing because I want to be rich. Um, <laughs> what is the minimum that someone can invest in like an ETF or an index fund? 
Yeah, I mean, the cool thing with ETFs and index funds is that you can get access to a lot of great companies for a lot of times less than 40 bucks. And there's brokerage firms like investment firms out there like the Fidelities and Vanguard that are offering shares. So you can buy into an ETF or a mutual fund at like a discount, a really discounted price. I shouldn't say discounted, but you are able to get in at a lower minimum than the actual price of the ETF. So for example, you can buy in for two, three bucks, for example, maybe not own the complete share, but you own a portion of it. So that's something that's being developed over time. Um, But yeah, I mean, the cool thing about it is that you get, if you say, hey, like I wanna get into Amazon, but I don't have enough money to get into Amazon, but you wanna get into ETF that their largest exposure out of the 507 stocks that they have, is Amazon, then you can go about doing that at a pretty low minimum. Nice. And so do you have a preference between Vanguard, Fidelity, Robinhood, and all of all the different platforms out there? Like, do you have a preference or one you recommend? Yeah. You would think I would be biased towards Vanguard because I spent the majority of my career there. And that's like where I started and they took a chance on a kid from the hood. But I actually... I I like their platform. I like what they offer. I don't like their technology. Vanguard over the years has like struggled with technology purely because they don't put money into it. It's another conversation. So I I don't, I don't like their platform. And for people who have used Vanguard in the past, I'm sure you probably have similar concerns. (laughs) They don't make it easy. And, and I'm saying this because I was on the other side of those conversations before. Where people would be like, I'm trying to put in sometimes millions of dollars into an account. And they're like, and I can't because your technology is not working. That's right. the type of issues that they deal with at Vanguard and continue to work on, albeit they're they're getting much better because they're putting money into the technology, but they have a long way to go to connect to, you know, work with or I should say, catch up to some of these fintech uh, financial technology firms that are out there that started as being technology firms, it just so happened to be an investing um, versus Vanguard, which is an investing firm that is trying to figure out technology. And it's, you know, it's definitely going against the grain for them. Now, Mm -hmm. I do like the technology of like M1 Finance, which basically builds these models, investment models for you. And then based off of your client profile, your investor profile, you fit into one or a few different models. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't like the fact that it's hard, it's hard to get in touch with a like a licensed representative there. So mm-hmm. if you have an issue, if you want to talk through the strategy, you can't just call someone at M1 Finance. So I, I don't, I don't like that because you're able to do that at other firms. The firm that has the technology right and the investment management right, in my opinion, is Fidelity. And I have no affiliation towards Fidelity at all, but I being a Vanguardian or what they call a crew member, old crew member, retired crew member from Vanguard. I left Vanguard, went straight to Fidelity and I literally have, I had no problems with them. Mm -hmm. And anytime I did have a problem, I pick up the phone and they answer on the first ring and I get my problem solved by someone who is licensed as a stockbroker that can just walk through whatever it is. Enough yeah. where I even trust them with like my tax management at times, like when I've done mm-hmm. like, you know, tax or like taxable rollovers or what have you. So I love their platform. I suggest it. But if you're just looking for one, you're like, I don't like Fidelity for whatever reason, like Vanguard's fine. Just be prepared for just a little bit of a headache. And then Charles Schwab is another one that has been around for a long time that has their technology down. Yeah. I've used, I think I've used all of them. I'm kind of an M1 finance girl, um, mm-hmm. but I still have Fidelity as well. And yeah. for that reason, I was like ready to throw my phone away with Vanguard. I was like, yeah, yeah no, they, they, they have too many issues for yeah. sure. But things that you can't deny about Vanguard, and let me kind of give them their flowers. Vanguard, when I tell you that I never worked for a firm that cared so much about their clients, mm-hmm. I like, I mean it, like i was fortunate enough to be in management positions at Vanguard. Every decision that we made was based off of the client experience. I don't know why they never text, you know, work with technology or, you know, try to figure that part out. But when it comes to like projects that we took on, even the expense of the product, we would say, how is this going to impact how much our clients have to pay for our funds? Mm -hmm. So that was like a big thing. 
another thing about Vanguard is they don't they don't care about how much money. They have billions of dollars coming into Vanguard every single day. In my six years of being there, not once did we ever talk about how much money was coming in. Mm-hmm. Like they truly care about the person and mm-hmm. they truly care about putting things in the layman's terms so people understand. They, I mean, every company has its quirks. There's happens to be technology, but like they truly, truly care. I it I also have pretty much every platform. So I still invest with Vanguard. I should mention that. My solo for my solo Roth 401k is with Vanguard because okay. frankly, I didn't have any any other options. Um, but I work with Fidelity, that's where my IRAs are at, along with my brokerage accounts. My 529s for my future children are <laughs> are with Vanguard as well through the New York State 529 program. Mm-hmm. And then I have some money just spread out between Charles Schwab and I feel like I'm forgetting one. I should probably not forget about where my money's at. Yeah. I have a, I have another one somewhere. <laughs> okay. um, but I haven't I haven't worked with M1 yet. Oh, okay. let's talk. Let's can we talk quickly about Robinhood? Yes. I actually don't like Robinhood at all. If you look up Robinhood and you just put it into the, you know, Google Robinhood and, and look up the news, like you'll understand why. Yeah. What I don't like about, I'll, I'll start with what I like about Robinhood first. I need to make sure I'm, I'm not, you know, sounding biased, but like. You're so what I, kind. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what I like about Robinhood is I feel like they did a good job introducing people that did not invest before to investing. Like Absolutely. my sister did not invest her money. She's older than me. She did not invest her money until she saw an ad about Robin hood and it made her comfortable enough to start investing her money. Mm-hmm. Even her brother's a financial advisor and stockbroker and she didn't even trust me. So if yeah. you can have one person or like a company do that, like kudos to you. So yeah. I'm, I'm happy for, for that, for, for the culture. What I don't like is everything that I just mentioned about like stock trading and gamifying investing, which Mm -hmm. has been proven not to work. And they were, and they continue to emphasize that day trading and, you know, non-taxable accounts like brokerage accounts. Mm -hmm. And that has been proven to be a, a losing strategy. They also haven't done all too well in the, you know, the 2000, financial crisis and then with like COVID and everything. And they also didn't do too well this year trying to manage downturns in the market. And I also don't like the fact that you can't call anyone there. And then if you're trying to transfer your money out, and I only know this because my sister's trying to do it now, they charge you money to take money out of of a Robinhood account to put into, you know, the Fidelities and the Vanguards of the world. I don't like that. And then I transfer. yeah, so my my fiance went through that experience as well because he started a lot of investing on Robinhood. Mm-hmm. And then I, I, it's not a lot of money, so I've just left what I had there, there. I'm just like, I don't really use it for anything. Right. Uh, it's, it, it's just, it bothers me, that fee. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not really worth it right now. I suppose right. I can move it at some point, but. And the uh, fact that you're not transparent about it, like I'm all for, charging fees where you feel like you're providing value, but like you need to be transparent about what you are charging and where that money is going. The fact that they're charging, they increased the fee from before it was, let's say like 40 or 50 bucks to transfer your money out. They increased it to a hundred dollars over the last couple of months. And they sent like one little email that went out, like, you know, one of those typical, like quick update or whatever, like changes to the agreement. And yeah. me being crazy, like actually went through and read it. And I was like, wait, like you're charging more, you're, t- you're charging double for someone to leave. And that's yeah. because they're, they're suffering because they know that if someone invests with them and you look at that hundred dollar fee, like you did, you said, I'm mm-hmm. not taking it. I'm just going to keep it here. That's what they yeah. want you to do. Yeah. So unfortunately you have companies like that out there, but I do appreciate them normalizing the topic of investing mm-hmm. but they have to do yeah hopefully they'll maybe move into your kind of style that you recommend <laughs> of investing and maybe have some etfs and I, I don't even know if they have those available on the platform yeah i think you can buy them on the platform my 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 issue with them is that you can't open up a roth ira for example like you mm-hmm. can't op- you can't open up any tax advantage account like brokerage accounts are cool, but like, if you talk to anyone who's rich, they will like literally tell you, I don't put much money into my brokerage account 
And if I do, it's after I take advantage of my you know, tax advantage accounts, let it be like 401ks, or if they're qualified to do like a Roth IRA for, for one reason or another, or like a traditional IRA or a 529 account or like a flexible spending account, like, or a, like a health savings account, for example, like they will take advantage of all of that prior to going to something that's not tax advantage for them. Because we know one thing about rich people, they don't like to pay taxes. So and we can do that as well. Like it's, it's not reserved for rich people. You know, we could take advantage of the tax code because it's literally on irs.gov, but it all comes down to like unraveling what's on there and using it to our advantage. So how do you help people do that? Like, I know you have your programs and, and services, but for people who are really like so overwhelmed, is that something that you do? Are you breaking down? Like you just mentioned quite a few different, you know, 401k, 529, Roth IRA, traditional IRA. If someone wanted to have a complete plan, is that what you help them to do? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I do. So not only do I have the platform being better wallet where we're on, you know, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, you know, I have the newsletter and everything. I do offer a product that I'm like really, really proud about because when I was a stockbroker and financial advisor, I wasn't allowed building digital products that were related to investing. Like it was mm -hmm. a big no-no with compliance. And if anyone's in the financial industry, you understand that your hands are tied behind your back and you have to go through so many different obstacles to launch a product like that. So the day that I quit, which was about, so next month is going to be one year since I quit my corporate job to do better wallet full time. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. At that point, I started working on a project that basically teaches you how to budget your money, how to pay off debt. Cause I paid off $8,000 of debt. I included all their strategies in there, how to manage your expenses because you know, in terms of like managing your money, you have to know like where your money is going all the way to like investing one-on-one -on -one, where I break it down, make it really simple. We talk about stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, you know, how to navigate the market, especially like today, my investment philosophy, how to open up an account. Why do I like the companies that I love? Mm -hmm. And then we start talking about retirement planning because, or just benefit planning in general, because if you went to any corporation, your first day. They sit you down. You're like, welcome to XYZ Corporation. Here's your benefits package. Good luck. And that's it. And yeah. then, then they tell you to go to do your job, right? Yeah. And then you're just like, wait, what am I doing? Like 401k, HSA, FSA. Like, I don't, I don't know what this stuff is. I don't know why it benefits me. I don't know how I can use it for my family. So I mm -hmm. literally go step by step on like 401ks, 403bs, TSAs, IRAs. I, I go through HSAs, even down to your like your health benefits. Like, what does yeah. all this like this jargon mean? And then the last one is the last module is, is uh, tax management. And yes. then because I'm crazy, I also had bonus modules on like how to invest for your kids. If you're Canadian, you want to learn how to invest. I have four hours of how you can invest into the Canadian markets if you're Canadian. And wow. like, I continue to build more and more and more on the course in addition to bi-weekly coaching and VIP email access. So like, I wow. wanted to give my students everything, not only me and my knowledge and experience, but also like this video content and modules and bonus modules and also like temp templates, guides and worksheets, all that stuff. And yeah. we're just, so this that's is awesome. year number one, year number two is going to be even more. So that's how I go about doing it. In addition to, of course, all the free content on Better Wallet, where I'm, I'm helping people streamline their finances and invest for themselves and for their family. That's so great. I, I love that you're taking people basically from A to Z, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking them from the point from the beginning all the way to the end because one of my pet peeves and i teach this in my course on how to create a successful course one of my pet peeves is when people don't take you through all the steps they kind of give you a little bit and they're trying to i don't know why like i've gone through <laughs> courses like that I'm, it frustrates the bejesus out of me i'm just right. like give me all the steps tell me i i took i i invested in this for a reason. So I love the fact that you're doing that. I, I don't, I won't hold you too long, but I had two things came up that I wanted to ask you about. You mentioned that you paid off $80,000 in debt, which is fantastic and amazing and such a big issue for so many people, but being a financial coach and, and investor yourself, 
what is your recommend recommendation or your thoughts on paying off debt before or investing or doing it at the same time? Like the Dave Ramsey's of the world, <laughs> you know, he promotes pay off all your debt except your house before you start mm -hmm. investing, which I listened to for several years. And looking back personally, I'm like, that was dumb. Right. But I shouldn't have said that because I want to know your take on it. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So uh, I'll start by giving flowers, right? So like Dave Ramsey is how I was able to go about thinking about paying off my debt, right? Like I never had, like, a, I didn't have a strategy. I didn't think it was possible. I, I just thought like my family, they were just in debt. Like my dad died with debt. He actually mm -hmm. died with debt and we had to pay off his debt after he died. It's a completely okay. different like story, yeah. but I was just so used to it and I thought I would just be in debt forever. So I looked at his baby steps and I'm like, oh, there's an actual plan to go about doing this. That's and true. I followed like the first couple, but one thing that I feel like Mr. Ramsey, Dave needs to do more of is stop talking ill on black people. Number one, number two, <laughs> number two, and that's a completely different story. Number two, he needs to talk more about, hey, like here's the formula but follow it as you wish. Like if step number three doesn't work out for you, then don't do step number three or do it the way that you want to go about doing it. So, so as it relates to your question of investing before, I'm sorry, paying off debt before investing, I, I actually don't have too much of a position on it. My position, mm -hmm. if I have one, is that I want to make sure that you have a plan. Like mm -hmm. forget everything else. Like what is your plan? Like, yeah. do you have a plan to pay off your debt? If you do, how does investing impact that? So when I was going off and I was paying off my debt, I knew that I wanted to invest in my retirement plan because I didn't want to lose out on the match. And I didn't want to become debt free with no money in my investing account. Like that was like my big thing. So yes. during that time, I didn't do any brokerage investing. I only did tax advantage investing where I knew that over the long term, I'm going to be really happy that I did that. And I made sure I got my match from my employer mm -hmm. and Vanguard did like four to 5% and then also 10% of your salary every quarter, which was oh. like wild. And that's, that's how I was able to build my investment portfolio. Like they're really generous about that. So the thing about it is like, there's a lot of people out there that have more debt than me, you know, multiple six figures. I was talking to someone the other day who had like $900,000 of debt. $900,000 of debt from like the level of schooling that she was able to get. She had a home, you know, some medical emergencies, like all types of stuff. And she was able mm -hmm. to pay it off. She was able to pay it off through managing her money and also increasing her, her income. But yeah, I mean, for me, like for in her situation, she could have definitely said, Hey, like, I'm not going to invest. I'm going to put my money all towards debt. But she said, well, instead of me becoming debt-free and I don't know, I'm just making up the years, like 2021, I'm going to become debt-free in 2025 because my plan told me that I can invest mm -hmm. while paying off debt. And though it's going to take me four more years in order to pay off my debt, I am comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. The challenge is a lot of people will go into it without a plan and they'll say, well, I'm just going to invest while attempting to pay down debt. I'm just going to pay towards the minimum or I'm going to give, you know, a little bit of change here and there. And like, what you find is that you will have this giant investment portfolio potentially, mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. you still have all this debt that's eating at the money that you could be giving to yourself and to your children. True. True. I like that. I like that a lot. I, I think that's a great idea or plan is to have a plan. I right. think that's really important. So other question I wanted to ask you is what are your thoughts on FIRE, the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early? Yeah. So I was introduced to that wonderful movement in 2012 from my good friend, Travis, who is the head of a uh, student loan planner. And Travis was, we came in during the, the same, the same, what do you even call it? The same group, the, the same cadre. And he sat me down he was like, Hey, like, I want to tell you about this fire movement where basically you invest enough money where you can just retire before uncle Samuel tells us that we can retire. It could be 30, it could be 40, it could be whatever, mm -hmm. but it's really hard to get there because you have to control the amount of money that you're putting in other things and mm. you need to put it into investing. And then once you get that number, you can live off that money for the rest of your life. And Uncle Sam doesn't determine on when you can retire. Mm. Now, when he told me that, I was like, oh my God, like this is 
wild because my, again, like going back to my family, my mom worked until she became physically disabled because she worked as a high security prison guard. And, mm. you know, it's just, it's real in, <laughs> in those streets. And then my yeah. dad worked at a warehouse until the day he passed away and worked 16 hour days. I didn't know of one person that has ever retired fully. Some people like they were, they retired, but they had to go back to work and you know, work all these different jobs. But I didn't know of anyone who actually retired. I didn't even know that concept until I worked at Vanguard. So it was appealing to me. And you know, I went after it and said, okay, well, if I budget my money, if I manage my expenses and I pay off my debt, then I can go and I can invest my money for X amount of years. And then by the time that I'm 42, 40 years old, whatever it is, I can then not work. That was the game plan when I was working in corporate because I hated my job. Mm -hmm. I hated yeah. doing the nine to five. I hated working for someone else. Now that I'm actually working on my passion, like I'm, I'm technically working right now. Like this interview right. is, is right. Like work, right? right? Like what better job could I, job could I possibly have? So right. for me to say at 40 years old, I'm going to be done. Like, oh, like I'm having fun. I'll yeah. do this until the day that I pass away. So Delian, the money coach, always mentions the, the concept of financial independence, relax early because you, know, you don't necessarily like retire and right. you know, be done with everything, but you can like relax. Right. Yeah. And yeah. if, if I could just relax and like not have to like focus on money, which my entire family had to do before, mm -hmm. like that would be the dream. So, you know, relaxed, you know, income and passive income and chill is like the goal. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Actually, I financial independence relax early because I think especially if you are an entrepreneur, creative, anything in that space, I think retiring fully, like not doing anything will probably drive you nuts. Like, <laughs> right, right. I could imagine like at 40, like, and that's not too far away from me Yeah, I, and not be able to like work with clients and teach them how to manage your money and all that stuff like i would go insane like yeah. insane like maybe i could do it at a beach like i can manage your money like while yeah. being at a beach You're relaxing. But, You're still but like i'm relaxing cool. right i'll never i don't think i'll ever fully retire okay well i did want to ask you i always ask my guests this what is one book that is your favorite book or that you would highly recommend to our audience to read in terms of entrepreneurship, and this is one that I feel like people don't talk about enough, there's this book. So I'll take a step back. I'll define the problem first. So mm -hmm. when you're growing up and even when you're in corporate, it's rare that you hear someone tell you, hey, this is what you're really, really good at. Here are what your strengths are. A lot of times you hear, hey, you're not good at this. You're not meeting this metric. Like you show up late, whatever it might be. And that continues throughout your entire life where people tell you like what you're not good at. The mm -hmm. book that completely changed my life is called Strength Finders 2.0. I, I have it around here somewhere. I don't know where it's at. But Strength Finders 2.0. And that book, why I like it is you go, you read through all the different chapters, but at the end, they have this quiz. The quiz takes 30 minutes to an hour to complete, but that mm -hmm. 30 minutes to an hour will completely change your life. Because at the end, based off of all your habits, all the little quirks that you have that we all have, um, <laughs> it will tell you, hey, here's what your strength is. I know for me, I'm a relator. Like, so mm -hmm. when we got on the line, like I was asked you, like, where are you from? Like, how did you get started? Like all these things. And we're talking more about, you know, you and like the business than anything else. Like we forgot about the podcast episode recording, right. but that's like what my skill is um mm. that i love context i love history like if i'm not watching the philadelphia eagles online or online or you know on tv i'm watching mm. vietnam war stuff like yeah. i love to understand like where our people come from like i travel to different countries to understand like where my descendants came from all mm. that stuff and then also like i i love what's the other i think the other one was like strategy like I love strategizing, like talking about like business and like how we can help like grow the brand and like optimizing your, like we we're talking about that before the recording as well. Yeah, yeah, how can exactly. we optimize the podcast? So yeah, I love strategy. I love just thinking about that comes along with that. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're a growing entrepreneur, you're trying to learn like what you're really good at so you can monetize your, your superpowers is what I call it. Then you want to check out Strength, Strength Finders 2.0 and take the quiz mm -hmm. at the end.
So I was, I don't know if you saw, I had like this huge smile on my face when you said strength finders, because it is literally on my to-do list from one of my mentors to take the strength finders test, but it's been on my to-do list for like months. <laughs> Do it. Even, even if you just need to take, just take the quiz at the end, like, like yeah. flip through the book. So you understand like what's in there, but take the quiz at the end and then go back to like reading the, the book. Okay. That way you're incentivized to like go and read it. Cause yeah. that's how I started off. The first time I read it, here's a strength finders 1.0 or just strength finders in general. And I didn't read the book initially. I just did the quiz. And then mm -hmm. I read the book the okay. second time around, I read the book and then did the quiz again. I have also been told it's a great way to hire team members, is have them yes. take strength finders. Because one thing that I think, and this is kind of outside of like our topic per se, but one <laughs> thing, one thing that I have found that I'm not great at when I make hires is a lot of times I hire based off of like the vibe that I feel with the person. So a lot of times they have the same strengths as me, which means they have the same weaknesses, but I'm hiring for my weaknesses. I'm mm -hmm. hiring for the things that I'm not good at doing that I don't want to do. And so I need to, they recommend, you know, having them take that strength finders test so that, you know, if you need someone who is more in the weeds and really detail oriented and all that good stuff, you're hiring that person instead of the person who's just like you and is all over the place, you know, whatever right. your strengths and weaknesses are. So this is just a sign, you know, we're talking about manifestation a little bit earlier. This is just a mm -hmm. sign. God's like, girl, get it together and take Go for that. It. it will change your life, I'm telling you. And then once you figure out what your five are, just write them down, write them down so you remember them. When I was at Vanguard, it was actually in my signature as well, my mm -hmm. email signature, because, mm -hmm. it, you know, every corporation has like different things that they do and Vanguard that was theirs. They were like, oh, like you're, you're a relator. Oh, you're context. Okay. And they treated it like a, like a personality test in a way. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. All right, Mark, this has been fan freaking. I, I really love this conversation. And one thing I don't share with a lot of people, what my first job out of college was at Lehman Brothers. Oh, um, wow. I don't know if anyone remembers Lehman Brothers. <laughs> yes, yes. Wait, wait, wait. When, did you, when did you leave? I left Lehman. So I, I, when you said maybe I'll, I'll be uh, hitting 40 soon, I am 40. So I left Lehman Brothers in 2005. So it was before they crashed. <laughs> yeah. Really good timing. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, so, that's a cool thing to have. Well, cool and unfortunate thing to have in your resume in a way. Cause yeah. like, Every time you interview, you now have to have the conversation of like, oh, you worked at Lehman? Like, what happened? Like, you were a part of like the crash. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, unfortunately, I kind of, I didn't really go back into the financial sector because I wasn't really interested in finance at the time. Mm -hmm. So I graduated during like, right, I graduated in 2002. So that, oh, yeah. that bubble that you talked about, the tech bubble, I experienced yeah. it. So I just needed a job. And I, at the time I wanted to move to New York. So I went to the University of Maryland. I was in the business school. I was in marketing, but I was in the business school. So they came down, they interviewed, I, they offered me a job and I was like, bet money. I'm, I'm up there. So <laughs> yeah, I stayed wow. for like two years, a year and a half, two years. And then I transitioned back into like marketing roles. Wow. Um, so what an experience. Yeah. Like, a, yeah. I mean, the just work for, cause for anyone who doesn't know, like Lehman Brothers was like the company that you want to work for in new york yes, period like yes. before the crash and and everything they they are like the top tier wall street firm that like everyone wanted to to, to work for so yeah. to get that experience and also like be connected with like some of the people that work there that mm -hmm. hopefully weren't a part of the uh some of the issues there i won't, won't go into too much detail yeah. I, i'm sure that's a really unique experience that you'll keep it the rest was, of your life. It it, i mean when you talk about like when my parents heard that i got a job african parents at Lehman brothers you couldn't tell like, them oh my God. <laughs> yeah no i'm sure they're they're really excited it's funny because like when i started at vanguard my mom had no clue what vanguard was and i was like oh you know and i didn't know who they were either so i was like trying you know how when you're trying to explain something you don't really know it i'm like yeah, yeah you know like you know it's a wall street firm they they trade securities and she's like securities like like adt like home security i'm like no like investing mom she's like well good luck like keep your options open 
And then <laughs> later I learned that was like the largest mutual fund company. And like, it's like a, I got into like a highly coveted role where they only chose like 20 people out of the country. Wow. And it, till today, she's like, she doesn't know like why I work there. Yeah. Even after like explained to her so many times, like what they, like what their accolades were. So different experience, but I gotta love my mom. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, for sure. So tell everyone where they can find you, where they can get more information about your services, your course, all that good stuff. Yeah. So if you guys are trying to find me, you can find me on Better Wallet, B E T T E R W A L L E T. And you can also find me at the betterwallet.com as well as our wallet on TikTok. Twitter, pretty much any social platform, even Pinterest. I have a Pinterest now. You can find me on there and just reach out. Like if, if you go to the page and you start following, like I'm really big on like introducing yourself. Um, uh, Jossian mentions it all the time where she says Jossian gems. So <laughs> she always mentions that, you know, come introduce yourself. Don't walk into someone's house without introducing yourself. And I'm now adopting that same model. So introduce yourself, send me a DM. I answer all my DMs. So just, yeah, reach out and we'll connect. Fantastic. That's awesome. This has been a wonderful, wonderful interview, wealth of information. I'm so glad we got a chance to chat. And I will also be sure to share your information like in the show notes and online as well. So cool. thank awesome. you. So Thanks for having me on. All right. Bye.